Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Alexandra Alvarado. I'm the Director of Marketing and Education here at the American Apartment Owners Association. Uh, so glad that you could join us today. We have with us K Properties, uh, Steve Haskell. So I will be talking a lot about Delaware Statutory Trust, specifically a theory that Steve himself came up with and has coined as the anchor and buoy strategy. Uh, we love investing strategies. It's always a good time to learn about a new way to invest. The market is absolutely changing. And so uh, we've kind of brought this webinar on to help you sort of navigate this landscape this year. Uh, before we get started, I do want to go over just a few housekeeping items. One is this entire webinar is being recorded. And tomorrow, I'm going to be emailing you all this webinar. So if you miss anything, don't worry, you'll get the recording and also the slides, of course, so that you can take notes. Um, I'll also include Steve's contact information in that follow-up email so that if you do want to reach out to Steve, he's a fantastic resource and uh, he can definitely guide you if you are looking to use this investing strategy. So I'll be sure to put that in there as well. Um, and at the end of this presentation, I hope you'll stay because we do have a free giveaway of a toolkit that I think a lot of you will be interested in. Um, so please stay for that. We'll also have questions at the end. So please, please put your questions in the question box, not the chat, so that we can keep good organization of the questions there. Um, and we'll be having a nice Q&A session with Steve towards the end. Um, this should take about... 40 minutes for the presentation time. And then after that, we'll do questions until we answer hopefully as many as we can. Um, and we'll send you all of that in the recording tomorrow. So a little bit about Steve. Uh, Steve Haskell has spoken with us a few times, has spoken for us a few times. He's a senior vice president at K Properties, and he works closely with the 1031 exchange and direct investment clients throughout the country. Uh, he heads up the firm's San Diego office, where he's considered one of Southern California's expert Delaware statutory trust investment real estate professionals. Um, so absolutely has done so many deals. It says here uh, he's placed $669.2 million in equity on behalf of investors in just 2022 alone, which is insane. So he definitely knows what's going on across the country, not even just in California. And he's helping so many investors to invest and place their money in Delaware statutory trusts uh, using his strategy that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, previously, he served for seven years as an officer in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, and also, even though he retired from active duty, he still serves in the Air Force Reserves. Uh, prior to that, he was in sales and marketing for multiple businesses. And he holds a master's degree from the American Military University and a bachelor's in accounting from Point Loma Nazarene University. So uh, lots of uh, great experience and background there, which I think is really helpful for all of you all. So um, again, please reach out to Steve if after this you still want to, you know, get some more personalized advice. But from here, I'll let Steve take it over so he can get started and tell you all about this new strategy. Great. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, I think this uh, presentation today is going to be a little bit different than we've had in the past. So in the past, we've really kind of honed in on the fundamentals with getting our audience all on the same page with what 1031s are and the potential benefits and risks of the Delaware Statutory Trust. But today I'm going to get a little bit more into the um, strategy and tactics of putting together a DST portfolio and our general thesis as a, as a company. And we title that thesis in this presentation as the anchor and buoy approach. Now, I, I actually um, did not coin this term personally. Um, this has been used by our firm for quite some time now. Um, I'm not even sure if we we put it together, or we, but we definitely propagate it. Um, this is a big staple in how we approach a DST portfolio for our, for our clients. But before we jump in, um, just a little bit of um, formalities here with uh, reading off uh, our risk disclosures. So the Delaware Statutory Trust is a security and it's regulated by FINRA the SEC. And so 
We want to make sure that all of our clients know that, well, for one, this presentation is not an offer of any of DST opportunities or any other investment that are on K Properties platform. Each investment must come with a private placement memorandum to be an offer. And um, all of our investors must be what's called accredited investors. That means they must have a net worth of at least a million dollars, not counting the home that they live in. If they're using an entity, that entity must have five million of total assets in order to be an accredited investor. Okay, so um, the IRC section 1031, IRC section 1033, and section 721 and Delaware statutory trust investments are complex financial and tax concepts. So please make sure you speak to your CPA and tax advisor um, and, uh, before making any kind of commitments or investing in DSTs. Um, none, nothing that we offer should be interpreted as tax or legal advice. Um, so we've got to remember that DSTs are a wrapper. They're a trust that holds title to real estate. That real estate comes with all the same risks and potential benefits as real estate you have on your own. So the real estate values can go up and down. Cash flow can go up or down or stop completely. Okay, so uh, make sure that when you are investing in DSTs that you educate yourself on all the risks involved, including illiquidity, tenant vacancies, interest rate risks, um, declining rental rates, um, and all potential bank foreclosure if there's debt on the property. You can stop cash flow or even lose your principal if there's bank foreclosure, okay? Um, number five on here, um, for an investor to qualify for any type of investment, there are both financial requirements and suitability requirements that must match specific objectives, goals, and risk tolerance. Part of my job here at K Properties is to communicate risk and to understand you, your uh, goals and objectives and risk tolerance and make sure that you're suitable for these type of investments. And for me, I need to provide you the data so you can make the best decision for you and your family. Um, DSTs aren't for everybody. Um, the included uh, scenarios in this presentation are hypothetical and are, are not intended to represent an actual investor situation or any performance of investments. All right. And also past performance is not indicative of future returns. So again, real estate doesn't always go up. Okay. Number seven, diversification does not guarantee profits or guarantee protection against losses. We like to diversify. It's one of the major benefits of DSTs, but it doesn't guarantee any kind of prevention of loss. Right. That's why we di diversify because investments can go down in value. Number eight, Past performance is not indicative of future returns. We already mentioned those. Make sure you please read any private placement memorandum before you invest in DSCs if you decide that this is an option that you want to pursue. And keep in mind that all the information that we're going over today is just educational. And um, all the securities that we offer are through Finix Capital, our broker dealer, and, which is a member of FINRA CIPIC. All right, here we go, everyone. All right, this is our firm, K Properties and Investments. We're a real estate investment firm. We specialize in the Delaware Statutory Trust and for 1031 exchanges. So we do have cash investments, but the majority of the equity that we raise is specifically focused on 1031s into the Delaware Statutory Trust. And out of our investors, you know, there, there's about 2,270 clients that have purchased over 9,100 DST investments nationwide. And uh, we continue to build up and grow. Um, and now we have a collective of 200 years at our firm of experience in real estate. And if you wanna look, uh, look into us more, you can find us at www.kpi1031.com um, where we house our portfolio uh, of DSTs. Typically 20 to 40 will be in our inventory at any time. And we work with approximately 20 different sponsor groups. Sponsor groups are the companies that put together the DSTs. At K Properties, we're advisors and serve in a broker-like function. So our job is to connect you with the sponsors that best fit what you're looking for and to build a custom portfolio for you that has multiple different sponsors that are managing properties. Um, and they could be different types of properties with different um, risks and different potential benefits all over the country. All right. But first, let's do a 
brief overview of some fundamentals before we get into some of the technical details. So we'll start off with the 1031 exchange. So for, if you don't know, the 1031 exchange is a tax deferred transaction under the 1031 Internal Revenue Code. So what this is saying is that if you sell a property, especially in California, you're gonna have a lot of taxes. You're gonna have taxes like um, capital gains tax, California income, federal income. You're gonna have a um, recapture of depreciation. A lot of folks don't know that one. And then there's a healthcare tax on there. And if you're in California, there's also potentially a mansion tax, right? So oftentimes, or at least in LA, there's a mansion tax. So um, it could be 30 to 40% of the price of the property potentially that you're gonna have to pay to Uncle Sam. But if you conduct a 1031, you can defer taxes that way and help preserve a tremendous amount of capital. In order to do so, there's some requirements. First, you must use a qualified intermediary. Don't touch the money. Whatever you do, when you sell a property, make sure it doesn't go into your bank account. It has to go into a bank account of a qualified intermediary that's gonna hold those funds. And in 45 days from the time that you closed on your property, you have 45 days to tell that qualified intermediary which properties you potentially wanna buy. There's a couple of rules there, but we'll save that for another time. Now you have 180 days from the time you closed on your property to close on your replacement property. Okay, and those two times run concurrent. So the 45 day and the 180 day time clock are running at the same time, okay? And when you buy your replacement property, it must be equal or greater value. And um, the next bullet point, main, uh, you must have equal or greater debt. That's actually not quite true. Most people do because they need to buy equal or greater value uh, in property. So if you have a loan, the loan is paid off in escrow, and then you have to go take on another loan to go purchase property of equal or greater value. But you can add cash, okay? So the main point is when you sell a property, you must buy another property that's held for business or investment purpose, and it must be the same or greater as the net sales price of the property you sold. All right, now here we go. Get into the anchor and buoy approach. Okay, so many clients come to us, let's say with a um, million dollars, right? They sell a property and they wanna to put together a portfolio. Well, they ask us, well, what should I look for when putting together a portfolio? Well, we boiled down the asset classes to start in two different categories, anchor properties and buoy properties. When we say anchor pro excuse me, when we say anchor properties, we typically mean assets like net lease, we call them, or commercial properties, like the ones you see in this slide, Pepsi Distribution Center, Walgreens Pharmacies, FedEx Ground Trans Distribution Center, Tractor Supplies. The reason that they're anchors is because the cash flow coming from these properties is guaranteed by the tenant. So no matter what happens in the market, those tenants are obligated, legally obligated to pay their rent unless they go bankrupt. And if they go bankrupt, that could lead to all kinds of issues that we can talk about at a different time. But as long as they don't go bankrupt, you should be getting a dependable check every month, okay? That's why they're anchors. Now, there's different aspects of the anchor and buoy approach that we can get into that has a little more nuance, but we're gonna start big picture right now, okay? So think right here, there's lower degree of variability in your income when you invest in net lease. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of expound on that term net lease. So when I say net lease, most people think triple nets, right? That's a passive option that brokers are telling me, triple nets. A triple net typically means that the tenant is going to pay for the maintenance on the property, the insurances, the property taxes. So it's just mailbox money, check comes in the mail. As long as everything goes right, you know, that's pretty true. It's passive and it's predictable in the mail. When things go wrong, that's another matter and for a different discussion. But um, 
Long story short, the chances of a publicly traded credit worthy tenant going bankrupt is extremely, extremely low. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's very low. Therefore, when we put together a portfolio for folks that are looking for dependable income, maybe a little relatively higher cash flow, and aren't as worried about upside potential or total return, well, a, a portfolio that's heavier in anchor properties might be a better option for those type of tenants, or excuse me, those type of investors. Now, some examples. This is a Frito-Lay distribution center, right? And you can see that there's bump, there's increases in the rent every so often. Now, this is 2% annual increases. If you compare that to the market recently, you might say that, hey, that's not gonna keep up with inflation. Well, that's true. You know, that property that's cash flowing at 6%, you know, as rent as the inflation has been increasing like it has lately, well, probably won't, it may not keep up those 2% annual bumps. But also keep in mind that revenue is not the only thing that's subject to inflation. Expenses are too. And right now in other asset classes, property taxes and insurances, as well as labor property management, are increasing faster than the revenue. And so, which is really putting a pressure on cash flow. In that case, um, well, in this case here, you can almost consider a net lease being an inflation hedge. So, it, it, especially if you're a defensive investor, you know, these net lease properties can be a good op option for a portion of your portfolio, especially one like this that has no debt. When you put debt on net lease assets, there's a plethora of risks that comes involved that we can talk about later, or you can give me a call or shoot me an email and we can talk about the risk that comes with net lease with debt. But in this case, with this particular property, there's no debt on it. So which mitigates a tremendous amount of risk and makes its liquidation strategy or sales strategy at the end disposition uh, much easier to obtain much more likely. Also allows us to weather any kind of downside. So if the tenant does go bankrupt, not having a loan gives us time to replace that tenant. So there can be a downtime in cash flow where you might not be receiving cash flow for some time, but when we, when we replace the tenant, cash flow can start back up again eventually. If you have a loan on it, well, that really makes the investors vulnerable to foreclosure risk and you can lose everything. Okay, so moving on, this is another example, a long-term 10-year lease to FedEx ground packaging systems, okay? So we also have other tenants that are like this, you know, Pepsi Distribution, Fresenius Medical Care, um, UPS, all these, we like these big credit tenants that can back these leases for long-term, in this case, 10 years. Gives us a high level of predictability for our investors, especially those that are retired and are really depending on that income. Another example of an anchor property. This one is a um, pharmacy located near me in San Diego. Long-term lease, 15 years on this one. Close to the beach, but you know the real estate's really expensive. Occupancy is high, vacancies are lows. High likelihood that that tenant is gonna stay in place. We renew, sell the property when we renew the lease. All right, um, here's a Pepsi distribution center. It's a warehouse. It's a bottling company, subsidiary of Pepsi. Also debt-free. Okay, now we're gonna venture on and talk a little bit about um, buoy properties. So when I say buoy properties, I typically mean properties that have leases that turn over more frequently. So when you have leases that turn over more frequently, you have more opportunity to increase the rents to market rate. So that's why as the markets go up, we increase the rents, cash flow goes up. But also, if the market goes down and these leases come due, your cash flow can also go down. So they go up and down with the market. That's the buoy, okay? Up and down with the tide. Now there's different assets 
that um, that have this nature, each of them with different dynamics involved and also at different stages in the real estate cycle. The easiest one to understand and what and, and is most common, in my opinion, is the multifamily property. Multifamily property, you have a nice pool of revenue providers, tenants, with leases that are typically renewing every year. So as the rents increase, as um, inflation goes up, you know, we can continue to increase those rents as necessary every year. But also keep in mind with these properties, especially multifamily, expenses also go up. The biggest one that we've been seeing lately is insurances and property taxes. We've seen some insurances in some places have tripled and that can really put pressure on your cash flow, okay? In situations like that, where in inflation and expenses is really growing faster than the increasing rents, well, something like an industrial property or even a multi-tenant retail can be beneficial. Because in those industrial properties and retail properties, many of those tenants, they're renewing maybe every two, three, or four years but we can often put them in triple net leases. So shorter term leases, but the tenant is obligated to pay for those property insurances and um, the taxes and the maintenance and so forth. So there's usually different combinations of, of lease types in these different assets, but there's more of an opportunity to um, take advantage of offloading the risk of the expense inflation onto the tenants in things like multi-tenant industrial and multi-tenant retail. Now, with self-storage in here, the nice thing about self-storage is you can increase those rents on a monthly basis. So even more of a buoy, right, than, than even the others, because you're increasing or dropping the rents on a monthly basis. But in self-storage, keep in mind, the maintenance on the building is super low. You don't have people living in there. Um, so a lot of the regulation and so forth is a lot less. So expenses are a lot less. So the inflation and expenses that we're, in, we're seeing isn't hitting self-storage as hard as it's hitting multifamily. All right. So all of these buoys, but all of them with different dynamics. And that's why we create a diversified portfolio for our clients. Right. And also they all have different stages in the real estate cycle. And I can get get into that in a little bit. OK, so um, here's an example of a buoy. This one has a loan on it. It's a 98 percent occupancy, fully stabilized, 38.4 percent loan to value. That means on the price the investors are going in, in this DST, they're 30 percent of their property that you're buying is going to be leveraged. So when they, let's pretend that this is a 50% leveraged property, okay? This one's 38.4%, but let's pretend it's 50%. What that means is if you put in $100,000 into this DST, you are buying yourself $100,000 of debt and $100,000 of equity, $200,000 worth of property, okay? So in this case, you put in $100,000, you buy your, yourself $100,000 of equity, and then less of, of debt, a little above 38.4% in this case. So um, that's how um, the debt in a DST works. You don't need to sign for it. It doesn't show up even on your credit report in any situation that I'm aware of. So. In that sense, DSTs are good for replacing debt because it's all turnkey. And with this loan to value, we feel that is a relatively safe place to be as far as the debt to equity ratio um, compared to what we were seeing, especially before um, the recession in 2008, where you're seeing 60, 70 and above loan to values. All right, now here's an example of a, uh, a business park. It's coming out. So this one is debt free. Now, it's in, in our opinion at K Properties, it's important to do these shopping centers um, debt free. The reason is there's a lot of moving parts and it's a very capital intensive asset. 
For example, we're, we're finding opportunities in shopping centers right now because of the owners that have debt. For, for example, we might we had a property recently where the property owner had debt coming due, a balloon loan. They needed to refinance. But if they refinanced, then the not only was the interest going to go way up, which is going to hurt his cash flow, but also he's going to have a massive amount of prepayment penalties, yield maintenance, and defeasance. So he he only had a short window to sell. So he was a very eager seller. Um, our sister company was able Cove Capital was able able to come in and buy it for a very favorable rate. Now, another reason that some of these property owners um, of shopping centers are getting in trouble is when tenants leave, they can be very expensive to retenant. I think I've seen a 30,000 square foot unit that takes about a hundred grand to what we call white box it, which means get rid of everything and just make it a blank canvas and move in a new tenant and do the tenant's improvement to get them in. Um, incentivized to stay, pay leasing agents, and so forth. In the past, many owners have used loans, used a lot of times short-term loans, to do that. Nowadays, it's too expensive to get those loans, or um, banks just aren't lending. So they get into trouble. Two things happen. Either they have to sell the asset, fire sell it, or two, they... Don't re, they don't increase the rents over long periods of time because they're afraid of losing the tenant. It's so expensive to replace. So a lot of times we're finding opportunities where we can go in where rents, rents are way below market, thus giving our investors a potential real opportunity to increase value in the asset. All right. So now things can go wrong. This type of asset class, I tell my investors that cash flow can be more volatile than maybe some others, but um, we're finding some opportunities here. Something it's a really good uh, conversation to uh, to discuss with investors because many come to us with a complete fear of retail, and I think a lot of that's warranted. You know, with the Amazon effect, with people shopping online, I think there is a lot of shopping centers that are going out of business, but we're also seeing a lot of opportunity. We're seeing that the market might be mispricing a lot of these assets because there is so much fear. So as Warren Buffett says, we're trying to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when the market's greedy, okay? And they may not all work out, but so far we've been having a very favorable um, experience for our investors. All right, um, multifamily properties, um, kind of a staple buoy. This is a townhome style multifamily building outside of uh, Nashville, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee in Clarksville. 100% leased. Uh, this was a newer construction when we bought it. All right. We already talked about multi-tenant retail investments. Um, this is a property um, that basically has the same story of what I just communicated with a buyer that needed to sell, which... Um, allows Cove Capital, our sister company, to purchase below replacement cost. We already talked about a lot of these bullet points as far as value add strategies. And um, we like to find them already stabilized. But even if the property is not stabilized, we have found opportunities where we can go in all cash, no debt, and renegotiate leases and turn them to triple uh, net style leases and bring in new tenants or replace them with stronger tenants. That has all increased value, but also sometimes there's little spots on the property, little pads that the previous owner did not utilize that gives folks like these big institutions and sponsors the ability to come in and put another, move another tenant in. Also opportunities to increase value. All right. So, um, before we go into the pros and cons, um, I think I want to make sure we're good on time. All right, looks like we're pretty solid. Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros of anchors and then some of the cons. A lot of it we've already talked about, but I want to just go over some of those aspects and sum the presentation all up for everyone. All right, the pros. 
Um, with the anchors, you're typically going to have a more predictable income stream. So what does that mean? If you're in a stage where you're retired and income is really important, then you might want to build an anchor por or a portfolio that's heavier in anchor style properties. Okay. But if you're still working and income's not that important and you want overall return, well, maybe we'll go heavier into the buoys that may fluctuate in cash flow, but may potentially have an overall re higher return on capital. All right. So um, also in these long, in these a lot of these net lease properties, we really target investments that have long leases, often 10 to 15 years. We have one on our platform right now that has 20 years. Okay. And each of those have different benefits and different um, risks. And I'll, I'm going to go into uh, a few more cons that may not be on the slide when it comes to those net lease properties. Um, reliable, potential reliable tenants. We like to really focus on those FedExes, those Walgreens, those Amazons, those tractor supplies, big balance sheets that are backing those leases. And by doing so, it allows us to be a little potentially more recession resistant. Okay, if the market goes down, it's really nice to have those tenants writing us a check every month. All right, now if you're in a triple net style property, there's very minimal moving parts, right? The tenant requires all. However, unless things go wrong, I'm going to talk about a little bit more in cons. Okay, and the big one, protection from inflationary cost increases due to tenants being responsible for the majority, if not all, maintenance taxes and insurance. All right, remember, in, rents do seem to be going up across the board currently, but not quite as fast as expenses in some situations. These net lease style leases allow us to hedge against that risk. All right, now let's go into cons. In a net lease anchor, the overall return is typically projected to be less than some of the buoy properties. And historically speaking, that has been the case. So when we sell these properties, we're not looking for huge gains. Okay, these are more of a cash flow play. All right, so um, also in these net lease properties, a lot of times there's only one tenant or maybe a couple tenants. So your revenue is not diversified. If something happens to that tenant, well, your entire cash flow is just going to stop completely. Whereas if you're in a multi tenant portfolio, an industrial or retail or multifamily or self storage, well, you have the buffer of the other tenants that are all generating revenue. So it's not that great of a hit if you lose one, two, three, four tenants. All right, uh, less flexibility in raising rents. So that's the big one. And that's really the big one why it's not a buoy is because typically when you have a net lease style property, your rent escalations are built in beforehand and they're typically not gonna keep up with inflation, at least not as of late. Lower upside appreciation opportunity, we talked about that. Um, there's a little caveat here. I don't really like to build this into our strategy um, when building a portfolio, but we have seen in times like 2010 timeframe, for example, when we saw a massive flight to quality, meaning people left some of the more austere asset classes like hotels, assisted living, um, kind of the one off camp or it wasn't cannabis farms back then. But what we're seeing now, like cannabis farms and solar farms and things like that, um, and then they flood to high quality, big tenant net lease assets. When that happened in that time frame, we actually did see significant bumps in prices and cap rates compress. Um, and so in, in down times, you might see that flight to quality again. People coming out of hotels, people leaving their highly, vari highly leveraged, var variable rate multifamily, um, major value adds, um, casinos, assisted living, canvas farms, solar farms, things like that, oil and gas, they leave those and they flood to these more dependable asset classes. Um, but keep in mind, anything, any, if it's real estate, it always can go down in value and distributions are not guaranteed, okay? So some other items I wanna talk about net lease that's not on the slide is, re especially regarding debt, um, the tenant, even though they're obligated to pay, may just decide not to. We have seen that before. We have seen a big credit tenant say, you know what? 
I don't want to pay for a few months. What are you going to do about it? Well, for mom and pop landlords, that's a very scary and difficult situation, especially if you have a loan, because your lender's still going to obligate you to pay. So it's nice to have a sponsor that's doing all that work for you. Or what about at the end of the lease? If that tenant doesn't renew, you have to go find a new tenant to move in. If you have a loan on that property, well, that can lead to foreclosure. And also the bank has a big say of who you retenant that building with. So if you have an Amazon and they leave or a Walmart, they're probably not gonna let you move in a Piggly Wiggly. They're gonna want another equal greater tenant. So US government, right? Not many options. So that's something to think about when you're looking at these net lease properties. That's why at K Properties, we really like to do these anchor style properties debt free. If you're gonna have debt um, that you need to replace, we like to focus it more on multifamily and self storage. Not saying any of them are guaranteed, but we found that that does mitigate risk quite a bit. All right, moving on to the buoys. Um, some of the pros, diversified tenant base. We already mentioned you're not completely, your, in your income is not completely reliant on a single tenant. Um, we have some value add opportunities in buoys, right? So we can go in, um, we can redo countertops, lighting, kitchens, bathrooms, just aesthetic, new paint, uh, things like that, that can allow us to increase rents and increase value. We can go into a lot of these industrial properties or retail shopping centers, convert their leases to net leases or triple net style leases where they have to cover more of the expenses. That immediately increases net operating income and can increase the value of the property and you haven't even had to add any capital. So long story short, buoys typically have more value add opportunities than anchors, but also more volatility. All right, we already know ability to adjust rental lease rates um, more frequently. That's a, a, ben a potential benefit of buoy properties, and uh, which talks about potential increased net operating income. Now, greater upside appreciation potential. So typically with these type of properties, you can increase the rents more, you can mitigate the um, init in, uh, incorporate initiatives that increase your expenses, which increases the net operating income, which we said there, that usually directly leads to an increase in upside and appreciation and price on the property. Not always, but typically. All right, but some of the cons, shorter term leases, greater variability in revenue, net operating income, which is a trades volatility in your distributions. Um, Gross leases, meaning that the landlord is responsible for maintenance, taxes, insurance, and increases from inflationary pressure. We already talked about that, especially with insurances skyrocketing, something that our landlords are really having to um, deal with recently. Um, and also, it's interesting, we've had properties where um, a property down the street sold for a tremendous price. And then we, especially in the South, this happens. Um, and then the county comes back and says, hey, your property is actually worth three times what you bought for it. So we're going to crank up your insurance or your property tax, excuse me. We're going to crank up your property tax. But for us, we just bought this property a year ago and like we're not, our rents haven't gone up 300%. So why are you pricing our property like that? So a lot of these big sponsors, they have lawyers on hand. They have to go back and fight that with the municipalities. Okay. Also something difficult that landlords don't like doing on their own, but it is a potential benefit when dealing with syndications such as DSTs. You have a sponsor fighting for you. Um, and just always keep in mind, it's real estate. They can go down in value. The DST does not shelter the real estate from economic conditions. Okay. Um, distributions are never guaranteed. You already know that. Okay, so here's a sample portfolio that we make for our clients. It's an example of a combination of buoys and anchors. So in this one, we have net lease distribution DSD, which is a Pepsi industrial distribution warehouse. So we're putting 250, so this is a million dollar exchange. We're putting $250,000 into that debt-free anchor. 
And then the next one is a pharmacy with a 15 year absolute triple net lease Walgreens. $250,000 into that. That's another debt free anchor. Then we move into a multifamily and shopping center. Okay. Those are two different types of buoys. We have a distribution anchor. We have a pharmacy and retail anchor. Then we have a multifamily buoy and we have a multi-tenant retail buoy. Okay. So different asset types, different geographies, and but and diversifying between anchor and buoy strategies. All right, and here's little uh, pictures of each of these potential asset classes. So we have FedEx distribution, that's kind of similar to a Pepsi distribution center as far as how we classify our asset classes, a multifamily property, pharmacy, multi-tenant. And we have these, let's see, in um in uh this one is in Colorado, distribution in Colorado, multifamily in Texas, pharmacy in California, and multi-tenant in Alabama. Okay, so diversified all over the country. Now, just to summarize the DSTs, the reason that our clients usually are interested in investing in DSTs is because they don't have to deal with the tennis toilets and trash, they get out of property management, they're looking to retire. Um, you have Pro professional property management in place. And so our investors can spend more time doing the things they love with the people they love. If you do want to find out more, here's our website. We have some goodies for you, as Alexander pointed out. And uh, you can also give me a call or shoot me an email. I'm a uh, Steve at KPI1031.com. Our website up here is K www.kpi1031.com. Just put a Steve and an at in front of that. And that's me, Steve at kpi1031.com. Happy to send you some of the educational material we have on hand here. All right, yes. Alexander. Thank so you so much, Steve. Uh, I put your email in the chat so uh, y'all can copy it from there, but I'll also email it to you tomorrow with the recording and the slides. And I do have a quick poll for you all. If you want to uh, get that free Delaware Statutory Trust Toolkit, I believe we may have had it at the registration page, but if you do say yes here or there, we'll be sure to send that out to you after this webinar. It's a great kit. It has the whole DSD listings, a magazine, um, a book that you can get. Uh, so all of that in that toolkit, uh, which is super helpful. So I'll leave that out. Uh, let's take some questions because we do still have time for that. Uh, Thomas was asking about some of the math uh, behind your buoy multifamily DST investment um, example. You said we put in 100K and we get 100K of equity. Uh, do the simple math for us, please. That's uh, at 50% loan to value. Sure. So if you have a property that has a 15, 50, 50, 50% 50 loan to value, that means the sponsor bought half of it with a loan and half of it with cash. Mm. So if I put $100,000 into that DST, I'm getting $100,000 of equity, $100,000 of debt, and I'm actually buying $200,000 worth of property. So if you sell your property for $200,000 and half of it was a mortgage, escrow is going to pay off the hundred. dollars and then a hundred, the other hundred is going to go into a qualified intermediary account. Now you need to go buy property worth two hundred thousand dollars with a hundred thousand dollars of cash. You can use a fifty percent DST to do that, or a portfolio of DSTs that average a fifty percent loan to value. Okay, that was a great explanation. Um, David asking, with DSTs, would we invest in a specific location where the business resides or the entire company? What would the time frame be if we wanted to change our investment to a different asset? Yeah, good question. So in the this is basically as close as you can get to buying your own property without having your name on the title. You even get a 1099 substitute at the end of the year that goes on the Schedule E of your tax return, which you may be already familiar with, right? By owning your own property. 
So the, the sponsor is the company that puts together the DST investment. They buy the property and then they hold title to that property in a trust. Our investors are buying a piece of the trust that holds title to the property. So it's kind of like you're buying into an LLC or you're buying into a family trust or something like that. The difference with the Delaware Statutory Trust, why it's special, is because in 2004, the IRS put out a ruling, our IRS ruling 2004-86, that allows that particular trust, and don't ask me why that particular trust, but for some reason, Delaware's trust qualifies for 1031. So you can 1031 in, buy a piece, you can 1031 out. Okay, so you're actually owning the real estate in that sense. Mm. That's great. Um, and then he also asked about the time frame if you wanted to change your investment to a different asset. So you got to keep in mind, these are non-liquid investments. That's why you have to be an accredited investor. There's no stock exchange. There's no um, realtor.com or anything like that, that you can list them and post them. Um, so you and only other accredited investors can buy in. So we can sell your shares. And then you can go into something else. But we're going to have to find another buyer. We're going to have to do a deal, you know, negotiate the transaction and then allow you to go 1031 somewhere else. It's kind of labor and it's a little labor intensive. And usually we recommend that you don't build that into your strategy, that that's a fail safe if you absolutely need the money due, due to an unforeseen life event. That's usually the only time that you want to want to get out on our secondary platform and we can't guarantee you a price that you're going to get it's whatever people are willing to pay but typically on average people are staying in for the life of the dst from the time they invest to the time that it's sold and when the property sold the money the um, potential appreciation goes back to the investors per their pro rata share of ownership so they get appreciation if there is appreciation and that typically is five to seven years. That's the average whole time. Right. Um, and Nicholas Wong asking, is it possible to trade from a DST back into real property? Yes, it is. So and that's part of the thing we go, uh, part of the items that we talk about when we're building a portfolio. If you're someone that may want to go buy um, that house down the street that they, you think will be a great Airbnb one day, but you can't get the owners to sell it to you, but you think you can in a few years. Well, maybe we put more, we concentrate more of your money into just one or two DSTs. So when they sell, you'll have it all at once. And then you can go back and take another shot at that Airbnb down the street. That's a good example. Um, Boris uh, asking, how do I know what is the value of my investment over time? Um, you really, honestly, you really don't. I mean, we can get appraisals. We can have sponsor um, uh, their opinions, sponsor opinions. Um, I've even had um, different brokers run their own comps on the properties, especially when um, we have some legacy planning events and when the owners passes away and they're trying to determine what the step up in basis is for the heirs. Mm -hmm. Um but you truly don't know the real value until you list it and put it on the market, just like other real estate. Sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, well, those were all the questions that we had uh, so far. So I, I'm, I'll see if anyone else last call wants to put in a question before we let you go. Um, but this was fantastic. Uh, loved the different take that you had today on the presentation. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, we're, we're in a different time now, so it's good to look at these investments a little differently as well. Um, and so again, we're going to send everyone the slides, the recording, Steve's contact info. If you said you wanted that toolkit, we'll be sure to send that to you as well. Uh, another question just came in. Two questions just came in. So we'll we'll okay. pause there and, and get these since we still have time. David is asking, is there a better asset class to hold 1031 than to trade out if wanted. Oh, is that asking if you want to sell early? Is there I a think, certain asset class that's more conducive? I think so. I think that might be what he's trying to get at. Mm, I 
Now, this is completely my opinion, and I don't know if it's actually fact, but um, so I'm going to start off and say, I don't think so, uh, just uh, just because I don't know, but it's my instinct that more people um, are familiar with multifamily, and that's easier for people to kind of price in their brain and understand the valuations of. So I feel that folks that may want to sell on our secondary platform, um, multifamily might be a little easier to do. Um, but that's also going to be what dependent on how fast they want to sell it and what else is available. Mm -hmm. So if there's other properties available that aren't secondary um, offerings, then uh, they and they're similar, cash flowing similar, similar, similar types of assets, it's going to be more difficult to sell that um, DST as a secondary offering because there's already similar properties that are out there that are cleaner exchanges. Mm, yeah, that, I think your instinct might be right. Um, David he clarified as 1031 short-term option. I, I think the, the what we're kind of getting at here is that this, none of this is a short-term kind right. of thing. Um, so, you know, don't plan on it, right? We want to know that it's possible, but I mean, it seems to me like this is more of like, a long-term investment, long-term meaning like more than a year or two. Um, right. Even if you did do a, just a regular 1031 into another, you know, series of properties that you own outright yourself, even then, right. Um, it's probably still, you're not going to do another 1031 exchange very quickly after that. Um, I imagine, you know, maybe you can expand on that, Steve, how um, quickly you see your investors who do a 1031 exchange just into another property, um, you know, do it again. I mean, I imagine there, there's some time in, in between that, right? Sure. Yeah. Honestly, about 90% at least of our investors, once they go into DSTs, they stay in DSTs. Nice. Um, yeah. You know, because you're getting the diversification and they're looking to retire mm -hmm. and there's really DSTs aren't perfect. But as of yet, for our type of investor, there's not really a better option yet. Maybe there will be in a couple of years and then we'll adapt and maybe start taking on new, new innovative ideas. But right now, the DST seems like the cleanest option for 1030 passive 1031 exchange investors. Um, if and also, I mean, if you take a million dollars and you break it up into two hundred thousand dollar chunks, right, you're more insulated from market volatility, you're getting that diversification, but you have less buying power because they're going to sell at different times. So you, it's, you can't buy much for $200,000 these days, you know? Yeah. So, um, so usually, you know, once you're in DSTs, you, you kind of stay in DSTs. They are going to have an option, you know, when these DSTs start selling, they might take some off the table, pocket some cash, or maybe they have some losses carried forward that year and they'll take a little bit off the table and reinvest the rest. But, um, and also we do, there are business plans for different DSTs. So if they want a potentially shorter option, there are DSTs that are shorter than others. At least the business strategy is, but there's no guarantee. You don't want to lock a sponsor into that because that, that doesn't allow them to be flexible with right. market forces. Um, you don't, cause you didn't want people fire selling an asset in the middle of COVID, for example, because that's when they agreed to sell it. You know, you want them to hold it through. Money came in, prices skyrocketed, and now they can sell it for way more than they would have if they were forced to sell it, you know, in July, 2022. So, um, or 2021, I should say. But anyways, um, yeah, so I think that, I think that it is probably a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> no, but I think that makes a lot of sense, right? You want them to sell when you're going to get the most out of it. And sometimes that time frame could change. Like we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball to expect exactly what's going to happen. So if they determine, you know, maybe we need a little more time on this asset, um, you're kind of locked into whatever, you know, within reason, I guess they decide uh, is probably better for what's in the market. Um so a couple more questions. Uh, what is the rate of returns on the investment? Maybe an average that you've seen, Steve? It's tough because if I'm going to use the average now, we're probably going to look like rock stars. I mean, <laughs> yeah, from... everyone in real estate's done really good. 
over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think net lease is going to give great IRRs, um, especially if you're debt free. You're, right now, interest rates are higher than cap rates. So it's good to be debt free. You're getting higher cash flow potential um, for the hold on these net lease properties. So if you can buy a $20,000 um, tractor supply, you know, with cash on cash in the fives or maybe even different ones in the sixes, um, debt free, you know, that could be a good opportunity. But historically, they don't really appreciate much. So maybe in single digits, also because it's debt free, you're not using debt to amplify your returns, but your downside risk has been mitigated tremendously by not buying that with debt. Now, multifamily, maybe a little bit higher, but um, like I said, right now it's great to be debt free on those because you're going to get potentially higher cash flow, but um even then, maybe the low teens we're looking at for IRRs. Maybe if that, if you put some debt on it, your cash flow is going to be way lower. You're going to have more risk, but probably more upside potential. You're going to be amplifying the, that appreciation. So it all depends on where the asset is, what it is, what your strategy is. You know, it's hard to say, but I would, I would probably put these assets on par with the rest of the real estate market, you know. That's great. Yeah. So safe and slow, maybe the way to go right now. <laughs> Net um, least digits, maybe up above 10, a little bit yeah. multifamily higher, a little higher than that. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, Mez asking, can you take advantage of depreciation, personal tax return when you buy into a DST? Yep. It's like you're owning your own property. You can right. depreciate, um, 39 for um, for commercial, 27 and a half for residential. Some of them have cost segregation studies. Nice. So there's expedited depreciation there. It all Wonderful. depends on your too. So hmm. make sure you talk to your CPA. Great. Um, Thomas Arroyo asking, how does K properties and investments get paid? Do you guys get a percentage of income or total investment? We get paid like a real estate agent. So one time fee on the front end um, and it's built into the deal. So when you see the um, the potential cash flow for the first year projection, let's say it's 6%, you put a hundred thousand dollars in. Well, it's actually 6% on the hundred thousand dollars because it's all built in. And then the sponsor sends my company a check after, after it closes. Got it. Okay. Um, your thoughts on mobile home park DSTs? Yeah, those are actually really interesting. I've seen a, I've seen a few. Um, I don't want to talk to any one specific, but um, it, it's kind of nice for a DST move because there's potential value add in it that's not really common for DSTs. Mm. The DST, you can't do major construction. It's not allowed for the IRS. But if you have a mobile home park, you can have extra space and then have tenants come in and put their own buildings there, right? So then you can start charging them rent. So it's a way to be able to add value in a DST without a huge capital expense and without and staying within the IRS regulation. Also, it's really interesting because um, it makes maintenance a lot more controllable. We're multifamily right now. There's a lot of money. Um, going into maintaining these properties and the labor because of all the inflation and expenses. But when you have uh, tenants that own their own properties, they're responsible to maintain those, right? So um, now where the drawback's going to be is on depreciation because you don't have a lot of depreciation in mobile home parks because you don't own those buildings. The tenant does. So there's different... Um, common areas that you can depreciate and fencing and things like that, but you're not going to typically have the tax benefits that you have uh, compared to normal multifamily. But I think it's a real interesting play. Hmm. Good perspective there. Uh, Nicholas asking how much percentage of the value of the DST goes into the transaction costs of conducting the DST exchange average guesstimate. I mean, when you're talking about, so we call it the load, like the front end fees going in. Um, DSTs, there's there's a lot of hoops they have to jump through. So it's going to be oftentimes uh, more expensive 
then if you're going to go with your neighborhood syndicator or something like that in an LLC somewhere. Um, so um, I would say maybe start out looking around the area of 10%, um, but they can all go up and down, you know, from there. Um, each one's different, but in the private placement memorandum, it'll list out the fees uh, in each, each DST. So you can compare um, each DST to each other. You can compare it to the business strategy to make sure that you're going to overcome those fees. That's very important. And also you can weigh for yourself whether the passive income, the diversification, and getting access to high quality real estate that you oftentimes couldn't get on your own. Is that worth the, the premium that going into a DST rather than buying your own property or paying taxes? Yeah. And I think that's really where K properties can come in and really make it easy for you to do that comparison. And also, you know, you know, that K properties has in a sense vetted these properties, uh, these DST offerings. So, you know, you're looking at a very, um, select, I think, uh, good, uh, good listing of, uh, options, right. Uh, and then comparing them and seeing which one's best for you. So I'll close out with that. Um, if you do want to look at some specific offerings and see how that might work with your investment strategy, it doesn't hurt to, you know, uh, contact K Properties or Steve and see what's possible, especially if you are looking to be on the more passive side uh, and you want to diversify into these assets you might not normally have been able to invest in before. I think that's a really... Um, really awesome benefit of doing a DST. So I'll go ahead and send you all again, the email tomorrow with all that info, if you want to connect uh, with K properties and Steve, thank you so much. Uh, that was so good. We're ending right on the dot on time. Perfect. So all right. Well, thank great you. Great timing. Good <laughs> all right, you. everyone take care. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you uh, next week or two weeks. I'll have the next webinar. Look out for uh, an invite coming to you soon. And Steve, I hope you have a great day. You too. Bye. Thanks. Bye.